Welcome, everyone. What a, uh, what a terrific turnout. Uh, it's uh, important that we have a good turnout for a very important topic like this and for a very distinguished speaker. I know that you're going to uh, enjoy this very much. It's the eve of Earth Day 2009, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Cornell's premier annual event on the environment, the Jill and Ken Iskell Distinguished Environmental Lecture. I especially want to welcome and uh, thank our uh, distinguished speaker today, uh, who's a very well-known sustainable design expert, William McDonough. He studied architecture at Yale University, receiving the degree of Master of Architecture in 1976. He founded William McDonough and Partners Architecture and Community Design in 1981. He and his firm have thrived, winning many awards that I will soon mention. In addition to leading his firm, in 1994, he became the Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, a position he held until 1999. He remains a professor in that department and in the School of Business at the same university to this day. He is also a consulting professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. And he was an A.D. White professor at large here at Cornell from 1999 to 2005. As I said, Mr. McDonough and his firm have won numerous awards, and I'm only going to mention some of them here. He has won not one not two, but three U.S. presidential awards. The Presidential Award for Sustainable Development in 1996, the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in 2003, and the National Design Award in 2004. In 1999, Time Magazine recognized him as a hero of the planet. In 2007, Time Magazine again called Mr. McDonough and his collaborator Michael Braungart heroes of the environment. He was also awarded the Benjamin Botwinick Prize for Ethical Practices in the Profession by the Columbia University Business School in 2003. He will now be able to add the Jill and Ken Iskell Distinguished Environmental Lectureship to his many honors. His presentation this afternoon is entitled Cradle to Cradle Design. So please share with me a warm welcome for Mr. McDonald. Thank you so much. Well, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm uh, a big fan of Cornell. I should say my wife went to Cornell, graduated in 1985. She sends her regards. <laughs> I'm here tonight to talk about a celebration of abundance, something lived and something dreamed. And uh, I think the difference between what we're going to talk about tonight in terms of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design and typical environmental uh, design conversations is that the world really needs to be seen as a place where abundance can be celebrated by all of us. And it becomes a question of human rights. And if we could look through the lens of abundance, we could imagine that we have an abundant amount of, of clean energy, an abundant amount of clean water, an abundant social fairness, abundant materials that are safe and healthy, and not bemoan our limits and simply strive to, to uh, eke out a meager existence with them. This is an important strategy, I think, as we go forward into the next uh, century and look at the fact that our human population will increase and our resources uh, will become strained and need to be put into closed cycles by cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, something lived and something dreamed. Now, I'd like to talk about design tonight as the first signal of human intention. Because I think designers have intentions. We wake up in the morning with intentions. And the question has to be, what is our intention as a species at this point in history? Because the human species is the dominant species. And if we look at what happens uh, in, in the world, we realize that we can control many of the situations that we find out there. 
99% of the large mammals are under human management. We are absolutely and clearly the dominant species. Now, if we look at how we're going to relate to that, I've come today from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I've had the privilege of being the dean at the University of Virginia School of Architecture of living in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. Now, when you get to live in a house designed by Mr. Jefferson, you think of him as your designer. And I clearly saw him as my designer. Uh, and you also realize that he probably saw himself as a designer first. Because all you have to do is look at his last design, which was the, uh, his tombstone. And you will notice that on it, he only recorded the things he designed. It says, Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which matured into the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia. That's it. Anything missing? Can you imagine being president of the United States twice and it's not important enough to put on your tombstone? <laughs> this idea is that he is recording his legacies, not his activities. He's recording what he designed and what he left behind for future generations, including us, Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. And this idea of legacy was not unfamiliar to him. Clearly, when he was designing the federal government with James Madison in 1789, he wrote a letter describing why he thought the term of a federal bond should be one generation. And his logic was this. He said, the earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those that may be paid during his own lifetime. Because if he could, and the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. The world would belong to the dead. Well, if we think about today, perhaps Mr. Jefferson would be calling for declarations of interdependence. And the, this interdependence would also include the rights of nature itself. Because when we listen to this idea coming out of the Enlightenment of humans having natural rights, we can start to ask, as Roderick Nash has done, what about the rights of nature itself to exist? This picture is of uh, a roof that we designed at Ford Motor Company. It's 10 and a half acres of habitat. And you'll notice in the lower left corner here, these are killdeer eggs. Uh, the killdeer arrived five days after the roof was put down. The idea here was to design as if other species cohabit the planet with us. And the idea of the rights of nature is fundamental, I think, to our human experience and what our human experience is about to be. If we look at the history of rights through the lenses of, of this country, we can see Jefferson reading Magna Carta, the rights of noble males, writing the Declaration of Independence at the age of 33 and 16 days, uh, the, uh, the rights of white, landowning, Protestant, males, 6% of the population. We then see emancipation, suffrage, welcome aboard ladies, 1920s. Then we see the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s. And then in 1973, the first time something other than a human being is given the right to even exist with the Endangered Species Act. And so the question is clearly that this trajectory is toward the rights of nature itself to exist. And what would that mean to our designs? Well, what would the first question then be for a designer? The first question we ask in our designs is, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? That's the first question. And it, it becomes a powerful one for us because it's not just our children, and it's not just our species, and it's not just for now. Now, this might be an emotional entreaty, so we need to put a clear goal with it. And I've tried my best to put the whole goal into one sentence. So it's all crammed together. Here it is. Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. Period. I had the privilege of, of speaking twice for President Bush at the White House, which for me was very much like an anthropological field trip, as you can imagine. <laughs> and 
And I had a chance to speak to the OMB and to secretaries of lots of departments and so on. And I was asked, uh, what did I think of clean nuclear power? And it's very interesting today that a lot of environmentalists are picking up on nuclear power as a clean form of energy relative to the CO2 question. And that's an interesting debate we need to have. But one of the things for design, from a designer's perspective, as I'll talk about now, very specifically, is that if we look at clean nuclear power, what we can celebrate is the idea of nuclear fusion and the fact that we could spend trillions of dollars on nuclear fusion, capturing its power immediately, because we've already got our fusion reactor exactly where we need it, 93 million miles away. It's eight minutes, it's wireless. <laughs> what is our problem? Um, I love clean nuclear power. Now, if we look at the, the relationship we have to society and to the economy in terms of the issues of sustainability and sustainable development, we realize that it's a much richer mix than many people imagine. We have been somewhere between socialism and capitalism in a social market economy, and any ism is a dangerous thing. A pure capitalist will cut down the fish and cut down the trees and forget the fish, for example, dangerous for the environment. Pure socialist is dangerous for the environment. I pointed out today that the former USSR has been declared by its scientific community to be 16% uninhabitable. They call it ecocide. 16% uninhabitable. This would be the equivalent in the United States of having to put a fence around Texas. Now, this means that really there's a third ism that's been missing, which we call ecologism. And ecologism would be just as dangerous as an ism, because it would be too extreme, worried about the environment only, not worried about people, society, or capital. And so we've developed a very simple fractal triangle to help us with our design work. And I'm going to use it to explain why we think the, the, mitch, the mix of sustainable design issues has to be really engaged on a very rich level. Because the problem with sustainability in many contexts is if it's seen as a kind of maintenance it's not that exciting. If I ask you, what is your relationship to your spouse, and you say, sustainable, <laughs> I'd have to say, I'm sorry. You know, this isn't very exciting. Uh, you know, this is not about maintenance. There's something much richer here uh, that we need to engage. So if we look at economy, equity, and ecology, what we can see is that if we want to be 100% fabulous, then we'd want to be 100% economic, 100% socially fair, and 100% ecologically intelligent. Well, that would mean in order to be 100% economic, we'd want to be 100% in every aspect of it. What is this corner right here? Well, this corner is, can I make it and sell it at a profit? This is uh, pure economy, economy corner. This is the equity corner of economy. This would be what? Well, perhaps are people earning a living wage? Uh, this would be the economy corner of the equity corner. This might be our men and women being paid the same for the same work. Uh, equity, equity, nothing to do with ecology or economy. This has to do with respect and fairness. Are people treating each other with respect and dignity? This is where we would find racism and sexism and things like that. This would be fairness uh, with, from an ecological perspective. What would that mean? Well, that would mean no more cancer in in products or in the workplace or phthalates in children's toys and so on. This would be ecology, equity, ecology first, equity second. What is fair uh, from the environment? Is it fair to cause climate change or global warming uh, and, and their impacts and acidification of the oceans and so on? This would be ecology, ecology. Are we following nature's laws? And then over here, this is Eco, what we call eco-effectiveness is are we being eff effective with natural systems that, um, and meet nature's design requirements? And this is eco-efficiency. Am I being efficient with these resources? Now, the problem we see in a lot of environmental talk today is that basically it's this zone that people are focused on. It's this economy zone still. Because what we see are things like business for social responsibility, where we look at people, this is business first for social responsibility or corporate responsibility. And then we see eco-efficiency, people trying to do more with less 
as, as, as if that's the fundamental goal of a sustainable strategy while they make a profit. And I think that what I'd like to talk about tonight is that the agenda is much richer than that. It takes us to the extremes of human rights. It takes us to the extremes of ecological intelligence. And so the fundamental question of our, of our, of our uh, of people at this time, I think, in history, is what does it mean to become native to place? How many of you consider yourselves indigenous people? Not very many. Now, isn't it interesting? Because a friend of mine, Oren Lyons, who's a, a, one of the faith keepers of the Onondaga, was asked by the UN to come to a conference of indigenous people. And his response was, who's not indigenous? <laughs> what does it mean to be an indigenous person? At the Hanford Nuclear Repository, they had a symposium where they brought scientists together with semiologists to discover how to mark the ground where we stored the plutonium so that even an extraterrestrial 5,000 years from now wouldn't dare to dig. <laughs> the semiology of extreme danger, right? How do you design a sign of extreme danger? And the Yakima, who were there for another meeting, heard about what the scientists were doing and started laughing and said, you know, you really don't need to worry about this. We'll tell them where it is. <laughs> They weren't leaving. <laughs> what does it mean to be indigenous? It means we're not leaving. We're staying. And we'll tell our stories over millennia. Now, what are these stories? Well, I think that the, our consciousness of, of where we live changed in the late 60s with, the, with this image uh, from the Apollo missions, the whole Earth image, the most published image, I think, in, in history. And... Um, our consciousness changed because we saw our home uh, writ whole, and, and yet our designs haven't really changed. Our buildings are still the same fundamental buildings, perhaps more efficient, uh, a little more efficient and so on, but our designs have really not changed. Uh, and I think that, that Einstein pointed out that no problem can be solved by the same consciousness that created it. And so as we see the problems out in the world today, we realize that it's a change of consciousness that we're going to have to, uh, uh, to integrate with our new design. And we can bring to that science that we didn't have in the 1960s. Now here are the ocean currents and the kinds of things we can now see, for example, as Captain Charles Moore out of LA has pointed out, in the Pacific Gyre right here in the North Pacific, uh, a few years ago, they found six times as much plastic as plankton. Six times as much plastic as plankton. They redid the experiment last year. They found 46 times as much plastic as plankton by weight in the North Pacific Gyre. What else are we learning? We're learning about the oceans suffering from acidification. 48% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide since 1850 is now in the oceans. And we're seeing that their, their pH has dropped from historical levels, which we tell, can tell from the Ross Ice Shelf cores, of 8 .8 to 8.2 pH uh, down to 8.06 today, and it's expected that it could drop to 7.9 pH by the end of the, of the century. This is uh, the point at which we start to see uh, the, f the fact that we drop out the bottom of the food chain and coral reefs start to dissolve. If this is our intention, if this is our design, if our design is to cause climate change, to acidify the oceans, to spread plastic in the oceans, to spread persistent toxins, bioaccumulatives, and endocrine disruptors, and heavy metals around the planet, toxify, we are doing a great job, if that's our plan. Now, if that's not our plan, it's become our de facto plan, because we don't appear to have another plan. So our, what we need is a new design, a new plan. Where would we get inspiration for this? Well, working with the natural world clearly helps us. This is Irian Jaya uh, rainforest, 240 plus species of tree per hectare. Um, we can look at the natural world for inspiration. As an architect, I clearly have to look at these lines right here. This is known as gravity. In my business, it's not just a good idea. It's, <laughs> it's the law. Yeah. Uh, so what other... What other uh, laws might we find in this picture? And so I worked together with a German chemist named Michael Braungart, and we wrote for the World's Fair in the year 2000, the Hanover Principles, designed for sustainability. 
and, and then more recently, in 2002, Cradle to Cradle, uh, remaking the way we make things. And the book is plastic. Now, why a plastic book? Well, it's described in the first chapter, this book is not a tree. Uh, we're a wash in plastic. It's a marvelous invention on the part of humans. And when you think about it, why would we want to use something as valuable as a tree to make something as prosaic as a flat white sheet? Because if you think about a tree as a design assignment, which we will again later in the talk, think about this. If I asked you to design a tree, what would I be asking you to do? I'd be asking you to create a piece of human artifice that makes oxygen, makes oxygen, sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, provides habitat for hundreds of species, accrues solar energy as fuel, makes complex sugars and food, uh, creates microclimates, changes colors with the seasons, and self-replicates. How are we doing? <laughs> it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> We're not that smart. And here we are looking at a tree. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we could design things that made oxygen? The, the notion then is that we could move from being the, the idea of just simply being less bad, which is our current eco-efficiency model, to being more good. Because being less bad is not being good, it's being less bad by definition. So by definition, we're simply bad. So if we say we're going to reduce the energy consumption of our buildings because we're bad, well, fine. You know, we're still bad. And it's like saying I could leave here and go north to Canada or south to Mexico. If I found myself going 100 miles an hour towards Canada, but I'm supposed to be going to Mexico, it's not going to help me to slow down to 20. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> now, if slowing down helps me turn around, then it's a legitimate part of the strategy. So efficiency is an efficient and, and, a, and critical part of our strategy. It's just insufficient to the task at hand. Because what we also see is that a regulation it's a signal of design failure. If we see regulations, it's a signal that there's something wrong and society is reflecting on it, and, and it's an opportunity for us to redesign and to change uh, the design of things. And the design we're talking about is meta-design, to get a whole new design moving. And the inspiration we use for this is the tree, and at this time of year, even here on this campus, as, del as delightful as uh, it can be, uh, is the cherry tree. And when we look at the cherry tree, what we see is this marvelous thing that is incredibly inefficient. Look at this. Do you imagine walking up to these trees and going in the spring, how many blossoms does it take? Yes. You know? But we, we love the cherry tree. We even know it's, it's thousands of blossoms to create a couple more because it's in closed cycles. It refreshes the soil. It refreshes our spirits and it continues to create these cycles. We don't love efficiency per se. Efficiency has no value per se. I mean, you could think of, uh, a, uh, of Mozart. You don't listen to Mozart and then sit there thinking, oh, how many notes does it take? You know? He could have hit the piano with a two by four and got them all at once. <laughs> Very efficient. But would we love it? So. What we're looking for is a way to make growth good. Right now, growth is considered by most environmentalists to be a bad thing. We look at asphalt as two words assigning blame. <laughs> so <clears throat> if we wanted to imagine what it would be like for growth to be good, then I think we can go back in a poetic sense and look at the fundamental, some of the fundamental science of the last century and use it for inspiration for design. So I like to look at E equals MC squared as a poem. And I like to ask myself, well, why was Einstein afraid? And, and as you heard, I grew up in Japan. Um, you know, why did Hiroshima disappear? Well, clearly, C is a big number. And if you, if you I'm not a scientist, obviously. If we, uh, if we square it, it's almost infinite. And therefore, if M is in any way a positive, then E is almost infinite. Um, and this is why uh, Hiroshima disappeared a small amount of M can yield an immense amount of E. But if we look at it as a poem, then what we see as designers is that energy really can come from the sun. And that's physics, and we have kinetic energy transformed into photons, it comes here in eight minutes. We have thousands of times 
more energy striking the Earth's surface than humans will ever need. So we will solve the energy problem because we have solar income. It strikes the Earth's chemistry, which is inorganic chemistry, and amazing things starts to happen, which Einstein called magic, which is biology. And so from a design perspective, we look at these for inspiration, and what we see is that physics meets chemistry, and we get biology. Now, if we take all the chromium out of South Africa and use it to make little products that we want to wear on our feet or clothing or watch uh, images on and so on, and we take that and we throw them into the ground as we finish with them, we will toxify the planet, and future generations will look back and say, what did you do with the chromium? What were you thinking? You've toxified us, and you've removed it from our utility. The other, other obvious issue here is this one of biology and how marvelous this idea that the Earth could be fecund and could be growing bio, biota on a continuous basis, that, that the basic design is of continuous growth of biota. That's really interesting. This is why asphalt is two words assigning blame, because it destroys the ability of the Earth's surface to be, to be generative. So if we look at this through Francis Crick's lenses, for nine years after discovering DNA with James Watson, he wrote an, a, an essay called uh, Of Molecules and Men for the a lecture at the University of Washington. And in that, he looked for what he called the nature of vitalism, what it meant for something to be a living thing. And his conclusion was in order to be alive, you had to have three characteristics. You had to have growth, even just to maintain stasis. You had to have free energy, and it typically came from sunlight. And you had to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. Wouldn't it be marvelous if humans could design things that followed these same rules, that we celebrated the growth of the, of the uh, artifice, that we realized that it was powered by outside income, otherwise you couldn't have growth, and that came from the sun, and that there was an open metabolism of chemicals that were operating for the benefit of the organism. Well, if we're going to look at these metabolisms, for example, then what we've done is parse that into two. What we say is that there's the biological metabolism and the technical metabolism. And things should be designed to either go back to soil safely in the biological metabolism, and or things can be designed to go back to the technical cycles, the technical metabolism. So we would end up with two kinds of nutrients biological nutrients and technical nutrients. So biological nutrients would be things like textiles, um, th food stuffs, uh, things that abrade like the soles of your shoe, uh, things that are going to go back to nature or into your lungs if they abrade, things like that should be characterized as biological nutrients and we should be able to return them to soil safely, soil, air, water, but typically to soil to help rebuild the soil safely, not just compost them and then have toxic compost, but safely compost it. Technical nutrients we call products of service. What you really want is the service of the TV or the computer or the carpet or whatever. What you get are toxic uh, molecules with no, uh, no way to return them into cycles. We started with the carpet industry because I started in the building it world. And we looked at the carpets and said, what you really want from the carpet is acoustics, performance, appearance, cleanability, and so on, what you get are toxic uh, materials. We looked at the average face fiber in carpets and found 16 known carcinogens in, in face fiber. And then the backing is typically PVC, which is also known to cause uh, the creation of dioxins in different kinds of situations and so on. So is, is it an optimized design? No. Well, what it could be is if the carpet was designed to go back into closed cycles, then the carpet could become a product of service. When you finish with the carpet, you call the company, they take it back, they get you a new carpet, the carpet becomes carpet again forever. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but this is what's happening now. We're very excited about this. Because then the question is no longer growth or no growth, but what do we want to grow? And then we can choose what we want to grow. Prosperity, health, security, community, peace, culture. Instead of this de facto plan that grows climate change, persistent toxification, and so on. So if we're going to do this, we need a goal and a trajectory. And so working with the US military on how to solar power the military, it's the largest single user of power in the world, um, we looked at this strategy of creating a flight path toward 100% sustaining 
uh, design. And let's take a look at energy, for example, would be optimized sustainability might be renewable power. You can define this however you, you have, uh, however you want after building consensus, but let's just say it was renewable. What we find is that efficiency is very useful in the short term because it creates dramatic value at the beginning, um, but it's insufficient because if your idea is to be 100% renewable, uh, just because you've used as little coal or nuclear as possible doesn't mean you've reached that. So we really need this effectiveness strategy uh, to take us over the hurdle. And that would be to start to adopt uh, strategies related to renewable power, how to integrate this economically, and, and how to develop the technologies that we're going to need. And, and this is a fundamental question because Peter Drucker, the management consultant, pointed out in his book, The Effective Executive in 1984, that it's the manager's job to be efficient and to do something the right way efficiently. But it's an executive's job to do the right thing. And then we talk about doing it the right way. So what is the right thing to do? That represents leadership. So what is eco-effective design? We use three design principles, waste equals food, use current solar income, and celebrate diversity. And we, we've developed this protocol that works from the molecule to the region. And I'll just give you my background and, and show you some of the designs. And, and then we can do some questions and answers. I was born in Tokyo in 1951. And when I was a little kid, the wagons would come in from the country and take out our poop at night. This was very exciting for a three-year-old. Um, they were, my mother called them the honey wagons, and they came to collect our night soil and they would take it out to the farmers, and it would become the food that we would eat uh, in the future. And so we just thought this was great. But there it is, waste equals food. Um, I then moved to Hong Kong uh, and lived with six million people on 42 square miles. And uh, we had cholera, typhoid, typhus, ringworm, scarlet fever, yellow fever, dysentery, you name it. And uh, people dying of starvation. And this is before the water pipeline came in from the mainland. So uh, it was a world of limits, uh, an astonishing world of limits. And everybody was very careful with everything, uh, especially water. During the dry season, we had four hours of water every fourth day. That's what we live with. And the relationship of people to the land was fundamentally different than here. This land has been continuously farmed for 5,000 years. How do you farm the same piece of dirt for 50 centuries if you don't understand nutrient flow? In ancient China, it was impolite to leave someone's house in the country after a meal without leaving a deposit because you were taking their nutrition. It's that tight an equation. I spent my childhood summers in the Puget Sound of Washington State where my grandparents lived in a log cabin and raised oysters and, and caught salmon and kept the spring clear and traded flowers for, for vegetables with the neighbors, things like that. And here we were in a world of abundance, but they were really careful with everything. They lived through the Depression, Second World War, and so on. And then I went to Westport, Connecticut uh, to be a teenager. My dad became the president of Seagram uh, overseas, the International Wines and Spirits business in New York. We lived in Westport, Connecticut. 16-year-olds had Porsches, and the kids left the showers running at the high school you know, locker in the gym after working out. So I left the showers running with hot water, and I freaked out. Uh, I didn't know what to make of this. The, the profligate consumption was, was quite astonishing to me and didn't make any sense. And, and so I, when I started my career as an architect, I built the first solar-heated house in Ireland in 1977, while I was a student at Yale, uh, which gives you a signal of my ambition, because there is no sun in Ireland. <laughs> um, but um, came back to New York, started my firm in 1981, as you heard, and then one of our early clients was the Environmental Defense Fund. And uh, EDF hired us to design their national headquarters, and their head of EDF as a lawyer said, if anybody in their office got sick from indoor air quality, they were going to sue us. This is how we opened the discussion. And so we went to our attorneys and said, what does this mean? And they said, well, it's called negligence. We said, okay, explain that. Well, negligence is when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you know something 
is bad and you do it anyway. That's negligence. And we said, well, that's fine. We're safe there. We don't know anything. <laughs> uh, what else? Well, negligence is also you're measured against your peers. You will be measured against another 33-year-old architect in New York. What should you have known? And we said, well, we don't think they know anything either. <laughs> because we went out and interviewed consultants to help us with indoor air quality issues. And the only one we could find was funded by the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And their primary scientific mission appeared to be to prove that there was no danger from secondhand smoke in the workplace. That was the state of the art in indoor air quality in 1984. So we went on with the project. And we started asking manufacturers what were in their products. What were the off-gassing products of the glues and the carpet, the paints? What was the quality of the light? Uh, did the furniture, could the furniture go back into closed cycles? So on and so forth. And the typical answer we got from manufacturers was, it's proprietary, it's legal, go away. Well, we're still at it now. And we added up the aggregate revenue of our clients the other day. It's a little over a trillion and a half dollars. And we're still at it, asking these questions. And it's interesting to look at the way the world reacts to these kinds of things. This is 2000, an article about our work and some others. And notice the language being used, killing, danger, sick. Uh, and what we're looking at is not scaring people with all of these things, but just simply getting about changing them. Get them fixed. It's not going to help us to become hysterical. It's, it's what's important is that we change things. And if we look at the way humans behave, it's really interesting that the first reaction is to regulate. This is a sign as you enter a building in California. Warning. The state of California requires that we warn you that the property contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. These chemicals may be contained in emissions and fumes from building materials, products, materials used to maintain the property, and so on and so forth. This is what we do. We warn you as you walk into the building that there's a problem. And yet the products that made the building that have this sign in them are still being made and used every single day. Explain this. What we find is that the way people focus on materials is they start by regulating and starting to restrict. But what's really exciting for us is that we do a full inventory of the materials used by human beings on the planet, and then we do an optimization based on some criteria that we need to have. And the criteria we've used, we use our cradle to cradle. The first thing we do is we inventory. We, we assess, for example, in this case, the textile seating fabric. In 1993, we assess seating fabrics like you're sitting on for the Steelcase Corporation, our largest furniture manufacturer in the world. And we looked at, at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industry and through cradle-to-cradle -cradle intellectual filters eliminated 7,962. We were left with 38 chemicals. We did the entire fabric line with those 38 chemicals and made a fabric so clean you can eat it, which is good news because it's going to be on the Airbus 380 now. And uh, if you find yourself at 40,000 feet with a fiber deficiency, you can eat your chair. Uh, the water coming out of the textile mill is now as clean as the water going in, which is Swiss drinking water. And when a textile mill's effluent is as clean as its influent, which is Swiss drinking water, you've reached the next industrial revolution. Because there's nothing to regulate. There's nothing dangerous. The trimmings of the cloth had, had, before we arrived, had been declared hazardous waste by the Swiss government, couldn't be buried or burned in Switzerland, had to be shipped to Spain. <laughs> and so you realize how, how strange and ironic this is, that you can, you can, your trimming is declared hazardous waste, but you can sell what's in the middle. So we do assessments based on human health criteria. We need to do science here. And so what, uh, priority criteria we have brought to the cradle to cradle agenda are no more cancer, no more disruption of endocrine systems, genetic mutations, reproductive toxicities, or birth, birth defects. We have sensitization uh, issues, toxicity issues that we care about as well for human health. For environmental health, we want to worry about toxicity for vertebrates, for invertebrates, for plants, bioaccumulation, persistence, toxic heavy metals, things like that. And for production process, we want to know exactly how something is made, where it's, where it's made, how far it travels, what kind of energy is used to make it, and, and uh, how does it affect the climate, and so on. Using these filters, we've now created a database of thousands of chemicals. There are 104,000 chemicals at last count 
uh, being used by human beings to make stuff, 104,000. About 30% of them have been tested for ecological and human health. Uh, we now have a database of thousands of them that we have characterized as red, yellow, uh, green, uh, where we can work with our customers on the redesigning of their products and, and point out that, you know, they're, that formaldehyde, for example, in this case is carcinogenic, uh, mutagenic, et cetera, and that we can develop systems that allow you to use it as long as it's contained outside of ecological and human health criteria and, and concerns but it can't be in a finished product that is exposed to people and so on. We then do optimizations. We have a supply chain tool that uses the internet and the web to communicate up and down giant supply chains to make products intelligent and healthy. So we can communicate with all the suppliers because typically they don't even know what they make. They just say that they get their dye from the dye manufacturer and then you go to the dye manufacturer and they just say, well, we get it from China and you know, then we go to China and find out where they get it and so on. You have to go up and down these supply chains in depth. And the first question we ask is, are all materials nutrients of one form or another? Can they be recycled and do we have the uh, ability to recycle them? And then we have criteria for certification. Are you, uh, is it biological or technical nutrient? Is it designed for reutilization or designed for environment? Does the energy come from renewable resources? Is the water clean enough to drink, and are you practicing social fairness? And then we do the optimization. So we move from a product that might have a lot of reds to uh, a product that is primarily greens and yellows. Let me show you some examples. Uh, here's biological nutrient products. These are the fabrics that will be in the Airbus 380. It's a mixture of wool and Ramy, uh, safe enough to eat, as I pointed out. Uh, this is the, the, the picture of the, uh, the trimmings used to be hazardous waste. They now become mulch and compost for the local garden club. This is a carpet we did for Warren Buffett's uh, Shaw Industries, part of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, a technical nutrient carpet where the carpet is designed not only appearance, uh, but also the materials inside the carpet are designed to be continuously reused. The, um, the fiber, the face fiber, is nylon six that can be infinitely reused through caprolactam chemical recycling. Uh, the base is a thermoplastic polyolefin that can be continuously reused as base. They're separated by gravity, um, shredded and then separated by gravity, and then can be made into carpet again forever. Uh, Shaw has the 15th largest truck fleet in the United States, and I don't know if you realize this, but the United States produces four and a half billion pounds of carpet waste a year. Four and a half billion pounds of carpet waste per year. So imagine if all of this material was put into closed cycles for infinite reuse. Uh, the furniture companies like Herman Miller, Steelcase, Hayworth have all certified their chairs based on cradle to cradle. They all come apart in a matter of minutes and all the materials are assessed uh, through the protocols to go back to industry forever. Uh, we have window shades, uh, we work with the U.S. Postal Service. Now all priority mail envelopes and boxes are all cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified. Um, they're designed as biological or technical nutrients. Put all the dyes, the inks, the adhesives, the papers, the plastics, all of it. Uh, and, and for the California Green, Green Chemistry Initiative for Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, we worked with them. And the fourth criteria of the new Green Chemistry Initiative for the state of California is to move toward a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy to leverage market forces to produce products that are benign by design and develop registries of products that meet these uh, criteria. So that's in the product sector. Let me mention some buildings and show you them, uh, and, and then we'll take questions. The, some of the buildings that I'd like to show you, this one is an experimental building we did for Overland College uh, for Professor David Orr, the head of their environmental studies program. And uh, the building makes 13% more energy than it needs to operate on an annual basis. So the building is net energy exporter. So imagine a, pro a project including the roof here and its, its parking uh, cover that May export energy beyond what's needed by the building itself. So it's a generative building. And the wastewater is treated in a wastewater plant uh, operated by the students 
in the building itself. So a building like a tree. This is our corporate campus for the Gap Corporation, now YouTube's headquarters. Um, here we, we covered the building with a meadow of ancient grasses. Uh, we got permission from the federal government to collect native seeds uh, from federal lands and uh, had this grass roof planted. It blocks all the noise from the airport. Uh, it provides stormwater retention, which is very critical on the site. And uh, the building has windows that open. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> In the early 90s, this was so novel that it ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal market section. It said, latest office amenity, windows that open. <laughs> we told the reporter we're at a low point in Western civilization <laughs> when a window that opens is news. The building is designed to be converted to housing in the future, if it ever needs to have another utility. And uh, it's full of fresh air and daylight. We use the outdoor air. Uh, all night long to uh, cool the building down under the, under the raised floors so we could have that free cooling during the day. And uh, it uses uh, significantly less energy than even the most efficient buildings in that part of California. Here's a building for Herman Miller, the furniture maker um, in Zeeland, Michigan. It was built for $49 a square foot, um, which is uh, Ten percent more than a Butler building metal shed. By working together with the contractor and Herman Miller, we were able to uh, optimize their budget around a building full of daylight and fresh air. Uh, when the president of the company hired us, he said, "Listen, if my building was a a car, it wouldn't be a Mercedes uh, with tinted windows. It would be a 1964 and a half Mustang, probably pink." <laughs> And he said if it was a suit of clothes, it wouldn't be Brooks Brothers button down, it would be an Aloha shirt. And we said, I see, you don't want to be in Southern Michigan, you want to be in California. Uh, so we built California. The building is full of daylight and fresh air. Uh, the productivity of the workers doubled. They, 350 workers went from a dark factory, uh, a completely dark factory, uh, to a fully daylit factory with fresh air and the, went from making $250 million worth of furniture a year to $350 million worth of furniture a year. This paid for the building in four months. This is a green roof that we did uh, for Mayor Daley in, in Chicago, uh, where he wanted to explore the idea of green roofs uh, for the city of Chicago. And we, we agreed, why not, in a city, have, have this kind of environment, which brings back habitat and species diversity. Uh, for Nike, we did a project on this uh, former harness racing track uh, in Hilversum, Holland, their, their headquarters for Europe, where we worked with the local town planners to optimize the plan uh, based on the idea that the buildings could be converted again to housing in the future. It's the largest geothermal uh, installation in the Netherlands. It's heated and cooled from the ground. Uh, PVC was eliminated in the project, and uh, the building is all designed to receive solar collectors and green roofs. In uh, 1999, we were hired by Ford Motor Company to redo the River Rouge, $2, million, $2 billion project, 20-year schedule. And this is what we were starting with, famous River Rouge. Henry Ford's uh, what, what uh, Winston Churchill called the arsenal of democracy. Uh, and you can see how much asphalt we're dealing with here. Uh, this is a typical industrial facility uh, in this country, uh, dead surfaces. So we decided that we would use different tools to solve the design problems of stormwater management uh, and, uh, and cr uh, building creation. And so we chose the native species to work with. And we also worked with the EPA and the, and the Michigan government to clean up the soil in situ using phytoremediation. We worked with Michigan State to create a phytoremediation program to clean up the soils using plants instead of scraping and baking. So this is also the science of restoration. And then we did the factory with its a million square feet and 10 and a half acre green roof. This is a roof. 
Um, now, when I had to present this to the board for approval, uh, they gave me a minute and a half. <laughs> and um, so I went in and we presented this. Ford had already designed a conventional stormwater management system to meet the Clean Water Act. It was $48 million. Our system of green engineering, instead of just using the conventional program, which they were ready to build and had already budgeted and put in their books, uh, our system of green roof and, and um, uh, habitat was $13 million. So Ford saved $35 million day one. And we pointed out to the board with a Ford Taurus at a 4% margin out of Chicago, this is the equivalent of an order for $900 million worth of cars. Approved. <laughs> Next. So it was approved in a minute and a half. This is the roof. It's a very lightweight roof. It's, uh, it's uh, sedum. Uh, it's a succulent plant sitting on lightweight gravel. Uh, it's only an inch and a half thick. And it's being... Uh, uh, inhabited by various species who arrived uh, and started nesting relatively quickly. This is an apartment building in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, solar powered green roofs. A proposal for the new Museum of Science and Industry for the uh, United Kingdom, uh, a building is six football fields large here and uh, Solar powered with a transpired solar collector here. So the building would heat and cool itself. Um, these are aircraft hangers to give you an idea how big, big this is. Um, we propose to have flocks of sheep on the roof. Because <laughs> a lot of people make jokes about our buildings, like, do you have goats or sheep? And so the idea of actually having goats or sheep, I think, is just great. You know, it'd be great, great to be able to say, sure. Um, this is an airport. Uh, we designed for a large U.S. corporation as a study of what uh, the future of airports might look like, solar powered. And we, we discovered all sorts of fascinating things about the way airport, a solar powered airport would function. One of the things is that it would power all the batteries in the electric cars that were for rent and uh, would use the batteries of the cars for storage for its solar power. This is a project, experimental project we're doing for NASA right now at NASA Ames Research Facility at Moffett Field in, near San Francisco. And it's a building designed to not require uh, artificial air conditioning. Uh, in a climate like that, we found that uh, these, are, these things are quite possible. And it, it, the idea is it would be a solar generator. I, I call it uh, mission to planet Earth, we come in peace. Um, and uh, it's sort of like an Earth station for NASA. It would be an office and research facility. This is a study for the waste handling system of San Francisco, where San Francisco wants to be a zero waste city. And so we're working with the, uh, their waste handling facilities. This is a project for a major retailer in the UK, six million square feet, looking at distribution centers for distribution and redistribution of, of materials through cradle to cradle systems. So, uh, Hidden in the landscape would be these distribution centers where goods and services would, would be provided to the market and, uh, and then materials taken back uh, to be recycled. I threw this in. This is a picture of a solar project in Germany to give you an idea that <clears throat> these solar farms could become our distribution centers uh, for goods and services. This could be a roof instead of just solar collectors. Uh, but they could, we could work within the landscape in a very compact way and, and get double duty out of uh, facilities like this. I'm also an, a venture capitalist. I'm a, I'm a member of uh, Vantage Point Venture Partners. I'm a venture partner. And, um, and we're investing in a company called Bright Source Energy, which is the, has a large contract, 1.3 gigawatts, with San Diego now to provide power out there, and we're also doing a project called Better Place in Israel and Denmark, which is an electric car system for the country, because Israel has committed itself to get off of oil. Uh, and the way they want to do that is developing electric car infrastructure. So we're financing that. I've also just finished up with a couple of projects. This is one that we're doing with Brad Pitt, 
where we looked at the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, and after two years uh, of the devastation, we realized that nothing was happening and that the community of the Lower Ninth Ward was still sitting uh, unbuilt and unrestored, and the people were, were desperate to come home, and they couldn't quite figure out you know, how that was going to happen. So we, we decided that rather than abandon this, because one of the questions is, should we build there at all, that, we would, uh, that that would be cynical, that we should come in and help. So one of the first things we did was scatter 150 uh, pink tents over the site where the houses were lost. We decided to do 150 houses. And um, as a fundraising effort, this is Brad's idea, we uh, put up these pink tents. And as we got the donations to restore the houses for the people back to their properties and build for them, uh, we righted all the houses and got them organized. So you could organize to, to right one of the houses. These are the clients. Um, and the way we did it was to hire 13 architects, different architects from around the world, to design houses that people could choose from. And we're making them as cradle to cradle as possible. And, and so the people can select from among these designs by well-known architects. And we're studying uh, modular construction, panelized construction, uh, stick building, and so on to get these things cost effective. And, and you'll see that we've lifted the buildings up on piers so that they're flood buildings uh, and, not, um, and, and not a place that would provide danger. What, what, what we see when a lot of the people are coming home is that they're building slab on grade in the same place where this flooding occurred, and we presume that someday in the future flooding will occur again. So this is up on the higher ground, this house. This was designed by Graft Architects in Berlin. Karen Timberlake out of Philadelphia. They're solar powered. The electric bills are coming in about $20 a month. And we're working with this idea that we would move in the next seven generations toward cradle to cradle uh, materials for all uh, the facilities. Uh, just finish with two large projects. This is a project we're doing for the Dutch city of Almira, which is here. This is Amsterdam. And we're looking at how Almira is to grow by 60,000 people uh, in the future, which has been mandated to do. And the first thing that we did with them is create the Almira principles, uh, where this, the city got together to develop principles for its activity first. So instead of starting with metrics and then working their way through tactics and strategies and goals, we actually start with principles and then we move to the goals, strategies, tactics, and then metrics. So the city has uh, developed its own set of principles for redevelopment. And let me just finish with China. China will house hundreds of millions of people in the next 10 years. Uh, they will rehouse as many people in seven years as, as we have in this country altogether. That's how big this is. And we were asked by the city of Luzhou in the south to design a horizontal plan, the extension of the city, the horizontal master plan, which we did for a city of a million. And you can see they have flood flooding problems here in Luzhou. Um, this is the site we were given, which is sugarcane. And we basically looked at it and said, wouldn't it be wonderful uh, if the, you could design a cradle-to-cradle -cradle city uh, in the future? We did this on our own after we finished the horizontal plan. And we thought about what it would mean to have a waste equals food city where the, f the fertilizer from the humans all went to fertilizer plants to create methane gas and, and uh, compost. And, and that could be returned to the city for its gardens and its parks. And the methane, turns out, would do about 21% of the city's cooking, uh, which would be a, really a terrific addition. We also realized that from studies in Berlin that cities can be more biodiverse than the surrounding countryside. You saw the monoculture of sugarcane. Cities with its parks and gardens can become highly diverse, and uh, we can encourage that diversity. And then we looked at how much energy it would take to power the city and how much of the bioregion and the biomass and various areas for solar power and so on would be required to, to uh, power, heat, cool, and provide uh, the electricity for the lighting and so on. 
And, and then finally, I think the thing that got the most attention was we decided after the Premier of China made a statement uh, a year and a half ago, or no, two years ago now, it was May, two years ago. He said, if China continues its current urbanization at its current rates, it will lose 20% of its farmland by 2020. 20% of its farmland by 2020. So we said, what if we lifted all the soil up onto the roofs of the city and built the city basically underneath the, the soils and turned the roofs into farming? Uh, basically, it would be a giant pot gardening. So we put this out just for the fun of it, just to see what it might look like. And then somebody sent me this picture from China. Just when we thought, you know, people were saying, you guys are loopy. Uh, somebody just as loopy as we are went and planted rice out on his terrace, sent us this picture. So let me finish with what is our intention as a species? Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. And the first question is, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Thank you very much.